Good evening. We are looking through the Old Testament. We're working our way through the Bible, and we're looking for the gospel. And I just want to say this occasionally as we do this series, just to remind you, which you already know, that the Bible is one of those books. Well, I shouldn't say one of those books because it's unlike any other, but it's a book in which you can look at it from different angles and gain tremendous insight from every angle. For example, we could do a study on the holiness of God, and every book would tell us something about the holiness of God. We could talk about God's wrath. The book of Judges that we talked about, or the book books of 1 and 2 Samuel, which we're going to talk about tonight, could be books where we'd see what happens when you fail to obey the Lord. It's clear in all covenants God made that he expects his people to do what he has asked of them. There's no doubt about that. God expects obedience. And when we don't obey or comply, he will allow us to suffer consequences like any good parent who wants their child to do right, but knows sometimes you only learn by doing. He always guards, he guides, he protects, but he also allows us to suffer from our own devices. And if we're willing to go away from him so far that we're not willing to turn back, he will respect our free will and allow us to live without him. He'll even allow us to die without him. Those are biblical truths. But what we're trying to do is look for the gospel in every book of the Bible. And the gospel is good news. All those other things refer to what happens when we don't obey the gospel. When we don't live out the gospel. But the gospel is the announcement that that doesn't have to be your fate. Jim McGuigan one time, I don't know if you ever heard of him. I think I may have mentioned him once or twice in a sermon. Jim one time said, you know, we were running by Christ in the millions. He was standing in the middle of a field. We were running by him. And he said, where are you going? And we said, we're going to hell because God's sending us there. And he said, well, wait a second, I'm God and I'm telling you, you don't have to go. And we said, you, we don't have to go. And he said, no. And we said, well, then I'm not going. And we were baptized in his blood. We were raised to walk a new life and we stand next to him to tell other people you don't have to go. The good news of the gospel is that that doesn't have to be the story. And we're looking for the gospel in every book of the Bible because... The New Testament says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. And Romans begins by saying the gospel was announced long ago by the prophets. So the gospel is there. Let's look for the gospel in 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st Samuel begins with the birth of Samuel, the judge and prophet. And it ends with the death of King Saul. The story begins with Hannah. She desperately wants a son. She has to put up with sneers and jeers from her husband, no less, and from others. But Hannah prays for God to open her womb, and God grants her prayer with the birth of a son, Samuel. By way of tribute, Hannah offers her son back to God. Now, we've already seen hints of this kind of thing when Abraham offers up Isaac, but that's because God told him to. Or in the law, when people would offer up sacrifices of their firstborn, but that's because God told them to. Here, Hannah offers up her firstborn to give back to the Lord out of gratitude. We're going to see an example of this in the New Testament. When Christ himself offers up his firstborn son for us, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Hannah dedicates the life of his son, her son to the service of the temple. The high priest Eli lives in and works in the temple and he has had wayward, uh, I'm sorry, in the, the, the house of the Lord. Eli has had wayward sons and God provides a second chance of sorts for Eli to raise Samuel in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And one can't help but notice the parallels between Hannah and Mary, both 
sing this wonderful song or prayer talking about how great the Lord is for providing. If you're looking for a key passage, look in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. Listen to who the hero is in these passages. The Lord makes poor and the Lord makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Notice how he's all the language is about God and about he brings, raises the lowly to great heights. You also find in the end of uh, chapter two, uh, in verse 26, that Samuel grows in stature and in favor with the Lord and with man. You'll find the exact same language in Luke 2, 52. When Jesus grows in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, we're seeing glimpses of a greater story than Hannah or Samuel would have known. The Lord calls Samuel in chapter 3, and Samuel is willing to listen. As he's told by Eli, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And Samuel is chosen to be a judge over Israel. Now, it's important to notice that God's power and presence is seen in these stories. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, the Ark of the Covenant is a preeminent focus. And why is that? Because even though your focus may be on Samuel, God wants to remind you that this is a story about God. And you see his power and his might in all those chapters. The children of Israel transition from a time <coughs> when they're under judge rule to a time when they're under kingly rule. And Samuel is the one chosen by God to help with that transition. The people want a king. Samuel warns about the dangers of having a king, but ultimately God gives the people what they're asking for. He provides that the king that he chooses must not rule like the nations around them. And the first king chosen for Israel is Saul. Saul is physically imposing, but he does, at least in the early years, seem to possess a kind of humility and a willingness to learn. And in chapters 9 through 12, we see the coronation and the story of the young king. But as has been the story over and over again in the history of Israel, going all the way back, what begins with humility, when you, risen, when you rise to a place of power, quickly turns into a story about pride and self-reliance. And so Samuel is forced in chapter 13, to share God's message of warning. And it's a precursor. We get a lot of news there that doesn't seem to work its way out for several more chapters, but that God's already turning to another figure. In chapter 15, God announces that he has rejected Saul as king. And some things begin to happen. Saul begins to show signs of worsening after the announcement. And we learn in chapter 16 and verse 14 that part of the reason is because the Spirit of God has left Saul. And when the Spirit of God leaves him, that leaves room for a different kind of spirit to take over. An important message for us that we're not just fighting against flesh and blood. There's a spiritual battle going on and we are playing with fire when we allow our love for God to grow cold, it leaves room for something quite powerful and bad to take that place in our hearts. Saul shows some of his problematic thinking. For example, he makes a rash vow that would have ended in the death of his own son if the people had not intervened. Saul is, in fact, a tragic figure. And then God tells Samuel to go and anoint a shepherd boy, David. And that's in chapter 16. You remember the story that 
surely it must be one of these more strapping lads. Oh, no. No, we've gone down that road. We've gone down picking the physically imposing one. This time, it's going to be the ruddy shepherd boy, the lowly, the one you wouldn't expect. Preview of coming attractions. That when the Roman Empire has all the major roads covered, who would think that the Messiah would be born to this pregnant teenager in a small away town? We know that David shows not just his willingness to trust God, but the power of God in the story. Just one chapter later in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where David faces the giant Goliath. He defeats him. All these stories, by the way, have a lot of small uh, nuggets that are worth looking at and considering when you're doing your Bible study. For example, David picks up five smooth stones. Why does he have five smooth stones? My mother told me when I was very young that it's interesting to note that we learn in other places that Goliath had four brothers. I don't know if there's anything to that. How many stones did David need with his trust in God? Just the one. And he defeats Goliath with the power of God as God works through the most unlikely figure. And he looks past all the physical imposing figure of Goliath. The very thing that stopped Israel in its tracks when they were supposed to go take the land, they were all Goliaths. And David representing Israel says that's no match for God. The friendship that develops between David and Saul's son, Jonathan, is like no other. They talk about a friendship, a love that surpasses the love of a man for a woman. And while Saul's spiritual state weakens and weakens, it leads him to jealousy to even try to kill David. Jonathan warns David, And David is forced to flee to a cave. And in chapter 22, a fascinating chapter, another little nugget to take a look at sometime. David is stuck in the cave of Adullam. And this story is told in several places, but I love this part of the story. It says, there's David stuck out there in a cave. And everyone who was weak, and everyone who was dispossessed, and anyone who had some loss in their life, went out to David for David to be king over them. There's this language that while all the well-to-dos are going after the uh, big names, those who were lacking saw something in David. David continues to do well while Saul continues to try to kill him, forcing David to be on the run, chapters 23 and chapter 27. And in between those two, In chapters 24 and in chapter 26, the tables are turned. And David is in position to take Saul's life, but he doesn't do it. Don't we see here the mercy of God? David will not take the life of God's anointed. He won't do it. We're going to see this kind of thing, this respect, honor, and shame culture playing out that when Wicked foes die. David and others will weep because he doesn't like when God's chosen or when those in positions of power that could serve God end up dying. Saul is frantic. He's looking for help. He calls upon a witch to summon Samuel from the dead. The irony is so strong because it was Saul himself who who outlawed this practice. The witchcraft works, much to the surprise of the witch of Endor herself. And Samuel tells Saul the tragedy that's about to befall the people and him. That's chapter 28. In the final chapter of the book, a wounded Saul lay dying. The arrows of an archer a Philistine archer, have riddled him. And he begs his armor bearer to run him through with a sword, which he won't do. So Saul falls on his own sword. The armor bearer sees what happens and he falls on 
his sword. We find out that Jonathan, Saul's son, has died in this tragic battle as well. It's a terrible, difficult ending as 1 Samuel comes to a close. As Christopher Wright in his book notes, the Israelites asked for a king to drive out the Philistines. But when their first king dies, they are more under the cruel oppression of the Philistines than ever before. So ends 1 Samuel. I want to pause and consider the roller coaster effect that we see in this book. First, Israel sees great leadership. I mean, Samuel's got some great leadership qualities. He's like a judge like no other. He's a military leader. He's a prophet. He even does some priestly things, but not in the tent at Shiloh. He rules well. His rule is so good that he helps usher in the idea of a king. But also at the same time, his own house struggles. His children give in to bribery and corruption. Second, Israel sees a great enemy. The Philistines are the worst. I mean, they've got great iron technology already. They win battles. They steal the Ark of the Covenant. Israel's deeply humiliated. And it leads the people to think their only hope is in a strong, unified leadership. Well, yes and no. Yes, if it's God, but no, if it's us. A kingdom is begun that will lead to Christ, but at what cost? The people want a king to be like the nations around them. They want a human king, a sign that they've rejected God as king. And God gives them what they ask for. But he says to Samuel, it's not you they've rejected, it's me. And Samuel offers grave warnings. And of course, all those come true. There's also blessings. It's a mixed bag. We see human choices and God's sovereignty at work. We make choices, God responds. God makes decisions, we respond. And there's an interplay between God's sovereign will and our free choices. And the last thing I want to get from this book, God expects his rules to be followed. But there's an interesting call to the heart of it all. In 1 Samuel 15, in verse 22, we're told to obey is better than sacrifice. Jesus is going to quote a prophet in the New Testament when he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Of course, the sacrificial system was part of the law. It's part of obeying God. But to say to obey is better than something that I've told you to obey makes us reach for something deeper in the story. Where are our hearts? The gospel is also found in 2 Samuel. David has mourned the death of his friend, Jonathan, and he even has respect for the death of Israel's king. When chapter 2 opens, David's anointed king over Judah, but those loyal to Saul announce Ishbosheth as king of Israel, and he reigns two years. Battles rage, but David grows stronger as the house of Saul grows weaker. That's chapter 3, verse 1. And ultimately, in chapter 5, David becomes king over Israel. He reigns for seven years at Hebron in the land of Judah, but once he captures the fortified mountain city of Jerusalem, he moves the kingdom there. That becomes his home base. He builds a palace and he reigns for 33 more years. And Jerusalem becomes known not just as the city of David, but as Zion, the city of God. He defeats the Philistines once and for all, and finally, The promise given to Abraham and Moses and Joshua comes true. They have rest and rule in their own land. And that leads to chapter 7, a very important chapter. David is promised an enduring, everlasting kingdom. Now, in this chapter, we learn of the Davidic covenant. That's where a son of David is always going to rule over God's people, Israel. What a wonderful contrast that Israel has experienced since they were first formed. One writer says, it makes a strong contrast with what goes on before David turns up. The depressing centuries of Israel's early life in the land of Canaan, the repeated unfaithfulness of the people, the chaos and anarchy of the era of the judges, and the tragic failure of the first king. But we learned some interesting things about the Davidic covenant. 
One is that David's descendants will be king over Israel continuously into the future, beginning with Solomon. Second, the sons of David who serve as kings will be regarded as sons of God. That doesn't mean that they're divine. It means they'll have a relationship with God like a father has to a son. Remember Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Number three, this relationship of reciprocal love will also involve obedience on the part of the king. And if not, punishment will fall upon them for failure to keep covenant. That means Sinai is still in effect, but he's making the point that the king is also a loyal subject to God, who's king of Israel. And then number four, David's house and kingdom will be forever. A son of David will rule over God's people forever. You know where this leads. It turns out that any human king is going to have highs and lows. No one of them will be perfect. No one of them can do the job fully. And so the book of Hebrews tells us that it's a son of David who now reigns forever over God's people. Luke, the historian, tells it this way. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 17. Acts 13, beginning in verse 17. We have the story beginning with the book of Exodus leading all the way up to David. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And wouldn't you know it, after telling the story of Israel up to David, the next step in that story is Jesus Christ. It shows you how important David is to the story. He reads up to 2 Samuel 7 and says, and that takes us to Jesus. I want to do a little bit before I close on what it means for David to be a man after God's own heart. Don't misread this. It doesn't mean a man who thinks and acts like God. We're going to learn very quickly that David is fully human. Yes, he shows strength and kindness in chapters 8 through 10, but he does some foolhardy, sinful things. Chapter 6, trying to move the ark when he's not supposed to. Chapter 11, the sin with Bathsheba. And you find some words describing the kinds of sins that he goes through that I wish I had said before the children came in. But we find David struggling with his better angels and his inner demons. Dave is such an interesting figure a flawed figure. The sins are so great. One of his own sons does the exact same thing. Another son tries to wage war against his father. Good thing the story isn't about David. A man after God's own heart means because the Hebrews didn't think of the heart as the seat of the emotions. They thought of the heart as the seat of the will. What he means is someone who will carry out my will for Israel. And that's what, De, uh, what the Luke picks up on when he adds the quote from a, a different book. And he says, he will do all my will. Jesus Christ is our ultimate king. He offers humility rather than pride and self-reliance. He receives all power and authority. And he is the fulfillment of Psalm 2 and verse 7, because in Mark chapter 1, the father says, you are my son, in you I am well pleased. God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. And he tells us that if we will endure, we also will reign with him. Let's not forget that Christ is our glorious king. And God is willing to work through flawed human beings as long as we let him be the true king 
and the author of every story.